matter of fact, I'm more nervous now than what I was talking to the, the students of Wollongong High the other day. <laughs> but um, I'll just tell it as I experienced it. Uh, you know, the shoes are pitching a bit and uh, just kick them off and relax and uh, make me feel at home. But um, just a little family background. I think in this year, the 50th year, uh, we've been asked to remember some of the things that happened and some of the things that gave us the freedom that we've enjoyed so much today. So I want to backtrack a little bit. And uh, Mum and Dad were born in England, did their training in the London Salvation Army Training College before World War I. Uh, Dad went to France and there, unfortunately, lost his brother. And after the war, we came out to Sydney uh, working in the Salvation Army. And uh, as uh, Jack has mentioned, the boys home and uh, the, uh, those who remember the People's Palace in Pitt Street. And uh, we went to Gosford, Wyoming, where I was born with a twin brother. And uh, then the war came and uh, we felt that uh, we ought to do something for the old country. Uh, I've always appreciated the love and the discipline that my parents uh, applied to us. It was rigid, it was tough, and uh, the discipline of school was great uh, because that was one of the reasons why I'm able to stand here today, uh, because of the love and discipline and the order that discipline gives you in respect to people's property, people's point of view. And we're also taught to honour God in Sunday school, uh, honour our king and our country and the flag that we love so much. There's a wise old saying and as often has happened, he who forgets the past is bound to repeat it. He who forgets the past is bound to repeat it. And once again in a short space of time we found ourselves uh, in war against Germany and apparently Hitler forgot to read the historic facts of World War I. Apparently he thought he was going to ignore that and change the situation. But uh, history did repeat itself and, and Germany was soundly defeated. Freedom is one of the most precious things you and I have. For if you lose it, you've lost everything. It doesn't matter whether you're a millionaire or what it is, and that happened during the war. Many people lost their property. But you lose the right to do what you want to do. The Japanese were not a signatory to the Geneva Convention, so it didn't matter to them. And it's true to say that you don't realize the value of a thing until you've lost it. And if all of us, for, for example, were suddenly to be picked up and trucked away to an unknown destination and locked up with no instructions of where we might go or where we'd finish up, we would suddenly realise that we've lost our freedom and what freedom really means. Down to the pages of history, God has always provided the leader of his choice. And it was so in World War II. I, as growing up as a boy, uh, loved these stories of Gallipoli, France, <coughs> never missed an Anzac Day, when we were kids, his dad would take us down to, uh, to the cenotaph. Love to hear the stories of some of those who were in Gallipoli, and uh, they have in, been embedded in my mind all my life. Uh, and when war was declared, it seems an unusual thing, isn't it, that uh, when there's a situation beyond our control, we call for divine help. And those of us can remember the churches were packed on a Sunday was hard to get a place. There were many miracles that took place during the war and I can't recall, I can't mention many of those, but it's a natural thing for those who are in trouble, who are in a situation, to pray to God. And I've said that to the students at Wollongong High the other day. It is a perfectly natural thing. And I said that no doubt in some time in the future they will be in a situation when all helpers uh, gone for them, and they, in turn, will ask for divine help. Who can remember on the 3rd of September 1939 when King George VI, Queen Mother's late husband, and this is what he said, I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. 
And he replied, Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. I never forgot that. And that was an encouragement, wasn't it? For the people of the British Empire facing the unknown. Not to put your trust in man, but put your trust in God. One of my sons gave me an autobiography of Churchill, and I've been a great lover of Churchill as a boy and during the war. And when he was 16 years old, he said to a friend at school, he wasn't much of a scholar, but he said, I can see further into the future than you. England will be invaded. I do not know by whom, but I shall be in command of the defences of London and I shall save London and England from disaster. And 50 years later, in 1940, he was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And when he rallied the nation in 1940, and I think France had fallen, you know, we'll never surrender, we'll fight them on the beaches, etc., etc., he finished up with this important statement. He said, It is God who in his good time will give us the victory. Now, on soldier's grave in Burma are these words. When you go home, tell them of us and say, we gave our tomorrow for your today. And I want to speak for all, especially the Australians of the 8th Division, who did so much for us and did not return. And we remember them. The Japanese were a brutal nation. They thought, here's the opportunity with England down on the knees and Germany racing along. Here's the time and now's the time to settle old scores and to take advantage. They had planned it for years, but they stayed at the war that they couldn't finish. And the Emperor had full knowledge of what Japan was doing because and he said to his leaders, Tojo and the others, uh, what will bring, what will the first 12 months of the war bring? And they said, victory. But he said, what after? And they couldn't give him an answer. In the army, strict discipline applies in the Japanese army, is brutal. Every soldier is told that he must die for the emperor and that is the highest honour that he can seek. And to us, to surrender was a disgrace. We were trash, as far as I was concerned. This Allied prisoners uh, who were taken prisoner of war, we should have died according to their belief. And hence, that we were treated so badly. The idea of the Japanese was to build a great uh, co-prosperity sphere. Uh, Burma, uh, China, Indonesia, Timor, and all around, around that area. They wanted to dominate that area and put it under the control of the Japanese. But it didn't work out that way. A lot of questions have been raised about Singapore and what happened. I just want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to give you a few pointers. The responsibility for the fall of Singapore really rested on the, the, the British government of the 1930s. The Baldwin government, the Ramsay MacDonald government, they were um, appeasers. They knew that Germany was arming, they knew that Japan was arming, and they did nothing. They rather hoped it would go away. Now Churchill had been out of office for 10 years, from 1929 to 1939, so he could not be held accountable for the fall of Singapore. As he said, I will accept the responsibility when, from when the time I take office, but I will not accept the responsibility that happened before, or what didn't happen. And he uh, had connections in Germany and he knew that the German Air Force was racing ahead of the British Air Force. The Churchill knew that they were on the warpath. And in those intervening years, which he called the wilderness years, he hounded and hounded the Ramsay MacDonald government and Chamberlain, and uh, people were coming to him and saying, Winston, you've got to do something. The Germans are getting ahead of us in air power. And Churchill knew that the future of England depended on a strong air force. So as he said, uh, he could not be blamed uh, for anything was done, uh, that wasn't done. Uh, he said, I had warned them over and over, and to use his old English expression, and none could gainsay me. 
On Singapore, he said, when he took office, I wasn't told, I didn't know, I should have asked. Now, these people in Singapore, the administration, lived in a fool's paradise. Planters, 10,000 miles away from England, having a great time, you know, tiffin at rattles and clubs and uh, soccer and rugby union and all that sort of thing, you know. And in the intervening years, the Japanese had been there for years with several thousand agents, such as businessmen, barbers, dentists and all this sort of thing. They had everything worked out in Malaya, they even cut roads into the plantations, they had timber under the bridges in case they were blown during the war, and still the administration out here wouldn't listen. Uh, the British press built up the idea of Fortress Singapore, as if there was a, tree, uh, a gun under every tree. And that was false and gave the British people the false impression. And also Australia, the Australian government of the day cannot escape entirely because they were the supporters of the forward defence of Singapore. So what actually happened was in 1937, uh, General Dobby came out from England and surveyed Malaya and Singapore, put a report back to the British government and said that the Japanese will come down the Malayan Peninsula. The requirements for the defence of Singapore were 500 uh, planes, 60,000 frontline troops, strong armies and navy support to defend the naval base in the island. But nothing was done. So it finished up, we had few tanks, the Prince of Wales and the battleship uh, Repulse were sunk within the matter of a few days after the declaration of war on the 8th of December. And so the defences of the island were practically nil. I stood on a hill in Johor, across the Straits of Johor, and watched the bombs fall on Singapore the first night. Uh, all the lights were on and they were partying and having a good time, you know, and they just didn't realise and just didn't think. And even, even towards the end of the uh, battle for Singapore, there were those who still believed, miraculously, I don't know how, that Singapore wouldn't fall. Now, the Australians uh, were criticised but gave a great account of themselves during the 10 weeks of fighting. They are the only ones that won the VC during the Malayan campaign. They, only, they were the first to uh, experience an atrocity by the Japanese in combat. So it was on for young and old. Uh, they knew exactly how many days it would take to take Singapore. Now the Australians had this section here, uh, our brigade, the 27th Brigade, uh, from the causeway here, this area here, was far too thinly spread. Uh, Perthville made the mistake of having most of the British troops over here. I don't know why he thought they'd come that way, but they didn't. They came across here, straight down the causeway, and into Singapore. Having fight, heavy fighting ensured, and uh, during the fighting there, the Japanese went into the Alexandria Hospital, and shot the doctors, patients, and uh, about 80 orderlies during the course of the fighting. There was no consideration the Red Cross, it didn't mean a thing. And uh, I was with uh, the uh, battalion here, and a lot of us got hit on a place called Bandai Village on the early, uh, early hours on the Monday morning, and uh, we were coming out, I was lucky, we came out of the first ambulance, and the second ambulance got a direct hit. Uh, so we're coming, we came down to the town here, uh, to a place called Oldham Hall, which was a converted girls' high school. And that's where we first met the uh, Australian nurses from the 2nd 10th AGH. Uh, they came down the ward, they were, they were marvellous, uh, shelling the hospital, they had patients down the street, in the houses, and uh, when the shells had come over, they'd duck, duck like this. But no patient was ever left uh, uncared for. But then on the Tuesday, they came down and said to us, we've got to go. They want us to leave, and some of them cried, and one nurse said to me, she said, will you pray for us? And to this day, and I still regret it, I never asked her her name. And I don't know whether she made it or not. And so they were taken away and came down into uh, Singapore Harbour. All, all the people were pushed back into the city, about a million. They were shelling indiscriminately theatres, houses, hospitals, women and children were being killed. The supply for Singapore was over in Johor here and the Japanese cut it off so there was no water in the hospitals. And we were squeezed into a corner and actually 
the longer it went on, the probably the worse it could have got. And so the, what happened was, uh, just tracking away back to the nurses, they went down to St Andrew's Cathedral there and waited, and they boarded two boats, one the Empire Star, which got home safely, and one the Viner Brook. And there was about 200 on it. But here's one of the tragedies. Down at Java, Sumatra Java, is what they call the Sunda Straits. The Japanese Navy had blocked the Sunda Straits in which no ships could get out. That was on the 10th of uh, February, 1942. The Dutch Navy sent a message to Singapore Admiralty to say the Straits were blocked, but that no ships should proceed. And there's nobody there to decipher the message. And 44 ships sailed on the 11th, and most of them were sunk on the 13th of uh, February, on the Friday, just before. And it was a shocking mistake. And that's the sort of thing that happened uh, quite a bit during the war. But I want to talk about Margot Turner. She was on one of the ships, an English nurse, and uh, survived the prison camp, and uh, made a dame and so on. But uh, she was on the convoy, and uh, her and a friend, when the ship was sunk, they put two rafts together, on which, in which there were 16 people, six children, two under one. And within two or three days, all the women had died, and the children were left. And uh, one by one, the little ones died, and Margot just laid them gently into the sea. And she was on her own for four days on the raft. She was burned black, and eventually she was picked up by a destroyer. She was hauled onto the destroyer by rope, and uh, fortunately, the, uh, the Japanese doctor spoke English and was a gentleman. He looked after her, bathed the wounds, changed the clothes, see that she was fitted out properly, and did that for two or three days. Then he said, I've got to put you ashore at a place called Muntok in Sumatra. So he had to put her ashore, and on the last visit to her, he brought her clothes neatly pressed on a coat hanger and handed them to her, and there he said goodbye. And Margot said she thought that was a great act of kindness. Now I want to go back to Singapore, and uh, on the Sunday, it was quiet. 8.30, everything was quiet. There were those who cried because the war was finished, those who wondered why there had been a uh, lack of support and didn't understand why. There were those who wanted to go on with it, but we were ordered to surrender, and we had no choice. And so at 8.30 it was quiet, and as a prisoner of war I was determined to survive no matter what happened, never to give up, I had faith in God and in Prime Minister Winston Churchill that old England, with all the history, would win in the end. And she did. She did. This is at the, um, called the Celerang Barracks, formerly occupied by the Gordon Highlanders. They were garrison troops and they lived a life of luxury. We arrived there in August 1941. They were having their morning parade at 9 o'clock, getting into their slacks and going on leave in Singapore. Now that was the attitude. And we were training our, training our insides out. So anyhow, but that's uh, Changi goes right down to the sea. All this area was, uh, the hospitals were over here, and further on was the English uh, uh, camp. And the reason why uh, it would have taken too much Japanese administration to look after all the prisoners, so a colonel was appointed for the Australians, a colonel for the English, and they were responsible to Jap headquarters, who in turn would pass orders to us the rest of the soldiers, and so the instructions were carried out there. I lived in here, two or three of these places here, the last one down here, uh, I was working there cutting wood for the cookhouse. Uh, and some of the troops uh, went into Singapore and were on working parties, and uh, that's when we first felt the pain of hunger. You ever gone home, you know, and say, boy, gee, I feel a bit peckish, uh, and you go to the fridge? Well, that pain is there all the time. And it's, your stomach shrinks to a certain degree, but all your waking day, you're thinking about food. I was just thinking about that trial for the night. When we got talking, uh, we often, as we often talk about what was our favourite dish, mine was br uh, baked rabbit with the trimmings and trifle. <laughs> Every time, they have the two dishes. Uh, but it, the pain is still there, and it's a constant nagging pain. And... Uh, 
It's, it's very hard to uh, avoid it. So what happened? A couple of important events took place here. The accommodation was about, about three floors there, one, two, three, one, two, three. And working parties uh, went out. We had a big Chinese uh, tiny vegetable garden there where we worked. And uh, there was a lot of money in the camp at the time. Some of the banks had been blown up and the boys raided them. And there was two up. And the, and the Japs were playing two up. They weren't doing their money, but they didn't seem to worry about it. Uh, we had a concert party there, which was excellent, and same with the British. And all that part was part of the uh, morale building. We had the Changi University, which was here. Uh, you could learn practically any subject in, in the world, Changi. Uh, all this took place in 1942 because we didn't know what the future held. Uh, but then uh, an important thing happened. The Japanese wanted us to sign a non-escape form uh, that we wouldn't escape. So they brought all the British soldiers from over there and over here, something like 15,000 of us, and put us into that area there. Now, they're, they're not all there at the moment. They're out uh, doing various jobs. But uh, we were there for four days, and she, no, no surrender, no escape. And the, our authorities were arguing with the Japs that we don't have the right to sign that form because we would forfeit our pay and entitlements. So after the fourth day, two Australians who had attempted to escape and two English who had soldiers had attempted to escape were taken down to, to Changi Beach and shot. Now after that then, we all signed these pieces of paper. Some, some signed Ned Kelly, Bob Menzies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know the Australian, don't you? Well, and the other Japs were satisfied. They scored the point. And uh, so... Uh, that's actually what happened. But the officer who was responsible for that shooting after the war, he was taken down, blindfolded and shot in Tingy Beach in the same place. Now, the Australians have a reputation for scroungers, you know, thieving things. Pretty good out there. And those who were on the working parties had access to warehouses where there was food. There was a great um, stock of food, you know, while the British were there. And they were stealing petrol from the Japs and selling it to the Chinese. And the Chinese were bringing medical supplies to our hospitals, and we owe a lot to them. And, uh, and of course, uh, everybody was trying to supplement the poor rice diet, and that uh, rice in the early days was a bit like this. Now, there's 13 ounces of rice, a bit soggy, and that's how it was soggy. And they gave us some boiled grass to eat with it in the early days, and uh, that didn't go down too well. But I wonder, could you manage on uh, that three times a day or less? There's 13 ounces of rice. Uh, so one day they got into the Nestle's warehouse and they were pitching uh, condensed milk. And the Jap officer heard about it and he thought he'd have a word with Australians. So he drives up in his star, star car, pennant flying, they love that, all that sort of business. Got himself in a position where he could stand over the troops because they're all so little, you know, they have to level them. And he said, now I know what you Australians are doing. He said, you're pitching condensed milk from Nestle's factory. So he puts the tin of condensed milk down there. And the Australian had it very large. You can put cigarettes in the band. And he knew that the boys were putting things under their hats and getting, into, getting things into the camp. And then the Japs couldn't figure out why. They were a bit, uh, you know, slow sometimes. So anyhow, so he took the condensed milk down, he put it down, covered it up to make the point with the Australian hat. And then he proceeded to say, now, I know about the petrol. I know that you said you're, uh, you're stealing the petrol and selling the Chinese. And he said, that has got to stop. So when he'd finished chatting on and telling us what he wanted, he thought he'd demonstrate the point in relation, in relation to the uh, condensed milk. He picked the hat up, but the tin of condensed milk wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> in disgust, in disgust, he hopped into the staff car, drove down the street, and went about 100 yards and ran out of petrol. <laughs> <laughs> the boys had milked the tank. <laughs> and, and then... Uh, with the water bottles, they'd cut them in halves, put a false bottom in, water in the top, and then cigars or things, you know, uh, uh, cheroots and all that sort of thing, whatever they could scrounge. And, and then they would do some stupid things. If you stole a tin of jam, say five pound tin of jam, they'd make you eat the loaf. Oh. And then they would bash for any, any, any given reason. And then give you all, might punish you for 24 hours, then give you all the food and cigarettes you can eat. Smoke. Un unpredictable. I, I often felt they were like 
monkeys. You never knew, never knew when they were going to spring. <laughs> but anyhow, that was uh, 1942, and uh, I personally finished up with a bad case of appendicitis and finished up in the Roberts Hospital uh, at, uh, in, in Changi there, and I spent uh, six weeks in, in bed and reading that great old story, um, How Green Was My Valley, by Richard Llewellyn. Uh, but things were to change. And then the rumours began about these big, the big project north, uh, land of milk and honey, take all your gear, you know, easy conditions, uh, better pay and all that sort of thing. And that's when we come to the journey of the railway. So we were shipped from, uh, um, there were three forces, F Force, my, my friends over here, they were on F Force, a bit further up than us, F Force, um, D Force and H Force. Now the purpose of the railway in Burma was to supply the, the Burmese, the uh, Japanese army in Burma, because the Americans were squeezing the uh, sea lanes and uh, that's the only alternative they had. But I want to go back a bit and one important thing. My mother and dad, but mum, had tremendous faith in God. And our first letter cards we got uh, in, in April 1943, and this is what it said. God has promised to bring you safely home. It is a trial of our patience and faith. He will not fail us. I have to say, the timing. It wasn't only a couple of weeks after that we were on our way, and who would have guessed that within eight months of that year, most of us would be dead. And I, I, I read that letter over and over again many times, holding on to the promise that God is able in all circumstances. And so we travelled uh, on this uh, rice trucks here, about 30 to the truck, you can see the boys taking turns standing there, there are 30 men inside there, they're taking turns getting a bit of fresh air. Took four days from Singapore to Bangkok, occasional stops for toilet and uh, a bucket of rice if you're fortunate enough to get any rice, sometimes we went without water. But we're just like cattle and uh, in the hot conditions, it was very hard to take. The cost in lives for the building of the railway were 13,000 Allied soldiers, 26, 46 Australians, and estimated 200,000 Asians. And here we'd be trained at a little place called uh, Bampong. We were up there in 1992, now it's a big station and a very big, uh, a big, big town, and we all detrained then a mile or so down the road, and then the Japs ordered, ordered us, and I'm speaking about our force now, H force, there were 600 of us, and most of them were unfit before we left Changi. Uh, so they, we laid all, all our gear out, and the Japanese, Japanese went in and took whatever they want. And some of the boys started selling things, and the Thai said to us, you might as well sell all that you have, because most of you won't be coming back, and that's true. So we had about 100 miles to go. With the results, a lot of the Japs started to collapse, and. Uh, with sore feet and so on. And uh, having arrived at this, uh, this place uh, called Kenyu, and I'll so just show it on the map, Hellfire Pass, that there's now the official memorial, and all these places represent other camps up there. So when we got there, it was virgin jungle. We had two days to clear a camp. Uh, the Japs supplied a few tents, uh, shocking, shocking conditions, and they wanted them back at work uh, and into Hellfire Pass. Oh, that's just uh, some of the Australians carrying some uh, sleepers there. You can see that there. Uh, see, some of them have got bare feet, and some of them are working in the quarries and, and, and cuttings, uh, and their feet were like swash tomatoes. Uh, they suffered very, very, very cholera, and the losses were enormous. Now, here's a bridge here, and uh, I think probably it's probably about 100 foot high, and it says here that uh, from getting this after months of starvation, had to crawl on their hands and knees across the bridge for fear of falling into the valley below. There were bridges like that uh, in which uh, many, many prisoners lost their lives. Now, this is a hut, um, or typical type of hut uh, that some of us had, and some of them didn't have any roofs on. They slept in the monsoons and the pouring rain and had to go to work and had to eat uh, sometimes less than 13 ounces a day. And is it any wonder that their bodies broke down and they began to suffer great hardship? And that uh, embankment there, I saw the English working on that early in the piece, and that was cut out in the virgin jungle, that was it. and all picked up a little coolie basket and just 
uh, packed down there. That's, that was the embankment. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of English soldiers lost, lost their lives there. Now, here's three fit men. Most of us who were in the various camps were like that. This chap has uh, a swollen stomach here because he can't do his short stuff. That's beriberi. Uh, there's wet beriberi and dry beriberi. And once the body breaks down, there's no end to it. It just uh, falls down and is uh, susceptible to all sorts of um, things. But the Japanese demanded, if they demanded, they wanted 200 men uh, next day for the work, wherever it was, they wanted 200. And there'd be arguments with the doctors, and doctors were bashed and ill-treated. And, uh, and that went in the main right through the whole of the railway until it was finished. They treated every prisoner of war as a unit in a great machine. There were 5,000 prisoners, there were 5,000 units in that machine. And if 200 of those units died or failed or were sick, they wanted them replaced it the next day or whatever the requirement was. Now here's an ulcer. Because of our rundown condition and our friends have had them and they, we know what they're like, um, it could be size of a 10 cent piece during the night and next morning it's like that. Now there were over 200 amputations through the prison, uh, by prisoners and uh, I had one on the ankle here and uh, it was small by the comparison but, but uh, it required two operations and uh, our friend uh, over there, he had a couple of operations on them too. But the, how can I describe the pain? Just like if somebody's got a red hot iron and burning into your system, it's agonising. And some of them lost whole limbs and shins and all that sort of thing and, and quite a lot lost their lives. Now the camp that we were was a couple of miles from Hellfire Pass. There's Hellfire Pass, the memorial, official memorial now. And our camp was a couple of miles up and we had to uh, come down the side of the mountain and uh, we had 68 beaten to death. And within a matter of weeks of our 600, 400 were unfit for work. And uh, we had to climb down the side of the mountain. We had a drill. We'd hammer the holes into the wall here. And then the, uh, the Japs would uh, put in the dynamite and blow them, and all those pieces of rocks were picked up by hand and put in a little curly basket into a skip and taken down further along uh, the track the, to, to build the embankment. Uh, and it rained and rained and rained. Uh, in the monsoons, everything was wet, the tents were wet. In our tents there were supposed to be four, there were twenty. Part of the cutting, you'll see there, eighty feet high, claimed many prisoners of war. And that was one of the main uh, cuttings on the, on the railway. It was a speedo. It had to be done by October, or actually September 1943. The Japanese wanted to complete the railway. So speedo meant night and day, 24 hours round the clock uh, to get the work done. And many lost their lives in the process. Those who were strong helped the weak. And I have to say here, the Good Samaritan story was carried out over a hundred times a day. Men helping their friends, men helping their mates. And before the, rail, the line reached here, all the supplies, uh, we were up there in 1992, uh, all the supplies came up by river and going down to, the, to where the barges were, it was so steep that you had to hang onto the trees in the monsoon, you'd slide down the side of the mountain and railway sleepers, sets of wheels, sets of lines, everything that was required to build that railway was brought up by us, who on the river part, as they called us, when we took our turn in coming up the side of the mountain. But in 1992, we went back there, and it was a great experience. And uh, uh, John and our three of our four sons went back, and I stood on Hellfire Pass, somewhat further down, and uh, uh, there was quite a few friends there. And, one of the uh, ABC reporters said to me, what kept you going? And this is what I said. I remember a particular day standing there near the skip and we were throwing the rocks over the side of the mountain. And I looked around and I thought, if this keeps up, there won't be many of us left alive. And across the valley, there are these great mountains. And the verse from the 121st Psalm came into my mind. I will lift up my eyes under the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. And that's 
I said to the reporter what kept me going. It was a tremendous struggle. Uh, it's a war of body, mind and spirit. In a shooting war you either get killed or survive and you haven't lost your freedom. But when your life is being wrested from you through starvation and primitive conditions and bashings and beatings, it's the war of the body and the mind and spirit. And it's a tremendous draining thing. And it's a tremendous struggle. But uh, one had to push on and not give in. And there are those, unfortunately, who did. But those who also gave in because they didn't want to be a burden to their mates, rather than let them struggle on. And there was a great spirit there. And so, at the end of no uh, October uh, 1943, the railway was finished. And we owe a great deal to the doctors and the orderlies. Without them, the Japanese had medical supplies not far away from our camp, available. And this happened everywhere but they refused to let them let it happen. So, uh, Padre Duckworth um, from the British Army, I couldn't walk and he carried me on his back down the side of the mountain. And to this day, I don't remember, I remember he putting me down once, even a bag of spuds gets heavy after a while. And I suppose I would have been about five stone like most of the rest of the boys. And he put me in the train, but I don't remember anything else. And we went back along this Wampo viaduct along here and uh, you probably remember it, uh, used to creak. We had a train over there, and as we were going back down towards uh, Bangkok, uh, and incidentally hundreds of lives were lost there, as we were going back, um, it, it, we could hear the timbers creaking. And uh, most of the boys had smoke smoked. <coughs> because I was a bit nervous. But that's one of the longest bridges, and it's still running today. Uh, it's a four hour run, uh, been uh, rebuilt of course, but uh, you can, we wrote on that uh, uh, to Bangkok when we were up there in 1992. So uh, we came then back to uh, this hospital camp called Camp Bury. Our doctor was in charge of it, and there were thousands of Allied soldiers, prison war, going through that hospital. He was the only surgeon. And it went on day in, day out, night in, night out, you know, operations one after the other. And um, he was a great. He was one of God's gentlemen, Kevin Fagan, and um, he did some, a tremendous job. And I said to him, years after the war, I said, Doc, I want to say something. I said, God always chooses the right man in the right place. And he's quiet for a minute, and he said, you know, the all important thing is how we rise to the occasion, isn't it? How we rise to the case. And the boys loved him. But then he had a batman uh, at Cambria, and Jimmy Fairbrother, I saw his headstone in 1992 and it came all flashing back. And he'd uh, survived cholera and he came down to the camp with us and I was looking after him. And uh, we chatted about going home and he said, no. No, he said, I'm not going. And he got dizzy again and he started to run down and uh, I knew that uh, He's going to die, and we got used to it, but I don't think we got callous to the extent that we were careless. Anyhow, I said to the boys, you better get Doc. So we sent for Doc, and uh, I could see him walking along now, the hut, and he put the stethoscope on Jim's heart. And I looked up, and the tears were running down his face. He said, I didn't want him to come. I wanted him to stay in chain. So about Wednesday, on the Wednesday, it was about half past seven, I said, uh, how are you going, my mate? And you said, I've never been so happy. And about eight o'clock, he's gone. And you know, when I stood at his headstone in 1992, I thought of the 23rd Psalm. I never really understood it till then. I believe it's true, the last verse I like, and Jim is gone, I believe there, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of the life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I believe it. And those of us who have had that experience, surely can't go through it without feeling something like that. Back to Changi. End of 1943, the railway was finished, we were back to Changi, some of us went to various camps where we were 
more food was available, and uh, uh, they put us, they got rid of the women and children, they put all the prisoners of war there because the, the net was getting closer to the Japs, they were getting strangled, and I think they put us there for, for, great, for greater control. Uh, so 1944, was, uh, we were building aerodromes there, uh, the Changi Aerodrome, and uh, during the course of that uh, period there, we heard about the landing in France, we had our radio connection in Changi Jail, even the Japs knew that, but I couldn't find it. And uh, so uh, the, uh, we knew the D-Day was on, and we were working on the aerodrome, and uh, then, then came the air raids. Uh, November 1944, I was sitting uh, on a committee for Christmas Day, and they were deciding what they were going to have for Christmas Day. And I can say to this, it was amazing, the things that they cooked. I don't know where they got the stuff from, but anyhow, there was cakes and there was results, there was puddings and all this sort of thing. And in the results was, we had a good Christmas day and we hoped it was to be our last. And what happened was, of course, we all got to trots. <laughs> <laughs> the food was too rich for us. So the Japs said, uh, Benjo's the word to go to the toilet. He said, oh, man, Benjo, Benjo, Benjo. Yeah, I said, well, look, I said, we had a little, we had a little bit too much tucker. Uh, and it was upsetting us. But... Uh, another remarkable thing happened for me. And when I was sitting down on a committee, a replied cable came from Mum. And which, and uh, my father thing just said, uh, uh, we are very well, don't worry about us, see you soon. And I sent the reply page back, I said, I'm fighting fit, chin's up, and see you soon. And Mum got that just before Christmas Day 1944. She couldn't have got a better Christmas present, could she? And that, again, you see, God is able. Now, I don't know who handled that cable van. I don't know how it came, but it did happen. And so at the end of 1944, they started to disperse us around the island in the defence, digging foxholes and all that sort of thing uh, in various groups. And uh, we went to a place called Adam Park and we were working down there for a while. And... Uh, uh, the, uh, we started to get the rumours then that something big was on. You know, the, uh, the Malays were saying, you know, that there'd been a lot of bombing and one thing another and so on. And there was a big conference uh, in 1945 at a, at a school not far from us. And uh, everybody was saying, I saw a well dressed Chinaman who said the war was over and all this sort of thing. But anyhow, our, our last experience with, with Japanese were civilians. And let me clear the point here. The civilian soldier, he's a factory worker, he works in a bank, or he's, uh, you know, or sweeps the streets. He had nothing to do with the military side of the story. And the soldiers were different, they were brutal, they were hard trained, and that's the way they acted. But these fellows had never seen a white man before, but eventually they took the guns away and uh, we ran the job. Now, in, in uh, Japanese terms, the, the number one nip is number one, the next nip is number two, and number three. Now, Blinky was called, uh, he was number one, and he was called Blinky because he's always blinking his eyes. Bucky was number two because he has teeth that stuck out a bit. Knocker was number three because he was uh, next down the list, and that's, just, that's how it went. So anyhow, uh, so uh, uh, on the 1st of June, 1945, it was, uh, my birthday was coming up on the 3rd of June, and I said to Knocker, I called him over, could have, I said, come over. And uh, I said, tomorrow, tomorrow, it's my birthday. And he didn't catch on. He looked up at me, a jovial bloke, and he looked up and, uh, and then I went like that. And then, then he grinned and he said, ah, oh, birthday, <laughs> birthday. So anyway, I didn't think anything of it. And uh, on the Wednesday, I looked down the street and here comes Knocker, two coconuts around his shoulders, and he came up to me and, and a bit of inflation there, uh, Coconuts were five cents in 1942 and ten dollars in 1945. Now I don't know whether he bought them or he pinched them or what, but anyhow he brought them up and he came up to me and he said, he laid, put them down on the ground and the packet of cerise and he said, presenter. And you know what we all say, don't you? You shouldn't have. I didn't have the money. I said, knock on, I haven't got any money. He said, presento. And so I just bowed and said, there we go. He didn't have to do it. And then the next day we saw Blink, uh, Bucky was crying. And uh, we went over and had a talk to him and he had some photos of his family. 
And he's wondering, I said, what do you call Uncle Bucky? And he said, I'm worried about the roads on Tokyo. He said, my family lives in Tokyo. And we didn't have anything against them. They're just civilians doing a job. And they have the same feelings like you and I. And then we used to risk, the boys to take terrible risks in stealing tapioca out of the Chinese gardens for those who were sick in the camp. We always tried to help each other, you know, and uh, the run the risk of getting shot or, or bashed up was, was always on the cards. And this particular day, um, it was my turn to bring the tapioca into the camp and I had a great bucket about this size, full of tapioca, and my mate Lion, he was with me, and they sprung a search on us. Instead of going to the normal entrance to the camp, we came in the back and they said, search over. And uh, I'm standing in the front line like this with this great bucket of tapioca. All I had was a haversack and a pork pie hat. And I said, there were 30 of us there, and I said to Lionel, I said, this is it. And the Japs have a one-track mind. If their sergeant said, look for haversack and don't look anywhere else, that's what he did. And sometimes their eyesight was so bad, and I thank God for that, <laughs> <laughs> because he never saw. So he went up the line, the first line, and he went up the second line, and my ribs were nearly cracking. My heart was busting. He only had a look at me. And uh, so he did the first line, the third line, and he came down to the front, and he saluted the sergeant and said, all men there, you know, send him, send him. And uh, then I said to Lionel, I said, get the boys behind me, because I had about 50 yards to go to the hut. Anyhow, we were walking down, and whew, was I glad to sit on the floor when we got to the hut. That's the closest I ever went, closest to getting caught with a bucket of tabiaca, because they did some shocking things. But our boys needed it, and the Chinese knew we did it, and we did that to try and uh, help them along uh, as far as food is concerned. But anyhow, getting close to the end now, uh, on the Saturday, uh, we sat down on the parade ground, and uh, one o'clock, uh, ten o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, nothing happened. And then in walked the British paratroopers. And they said, boys, the war's over. Well, what, you want, what, what we want you to do is to stay inside. There's only six of us on the island and about 40,000 Japs. He said, just wait until some of the relieving troops come in. Uh, and then they said, apart from uh, food, what would you like? And we said, we'd like a radio. So anyhow, they come back with one of those, you know those old big console radios? <laughs> anyhow, a couple of hours, they came back with that, and uh, we sat up at night time, and oh, it was tremendous to hear music, and all that sort of thing. And uh, then after a few days, we all shot through into Singapore. I can't remember how I got in there, but I went on to the hospital ship Mananda, and uh, there I, asked, I only wanted a piece of bread and butter, uh, and he gave us a pound loaf of butter and a pound loaf of... Uh, a pound of pound loaf of bread and a pound of butter and a bottle of beer and then we went and saw the nurses and then we went to the Sussex and we had a nice meal on the Sussex and our friend over here went on the battleship some of them went on uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten's battleship and spent the night there and, and so it was, it was a great time but we all finished up coming back to Changi and Changi then became a big city and uh, there was movement uh, uh, people going home and all that sort of thing. But I have to say here, it was the atom bomb that saved their life. Because the orders had gone out in 1943, like in St. Darkin, where they murdered the Australians, that in the Avenian invasion, every prisoner of war was to be shot. So that was the attitude right through. And uh, then uh, we just, uh, I, I was on an aerodrome one day, and they said, do you want a, a quick flight home to Darwin? I said, no. I said, I've been here three and a half years. I said, I'll wait for the ship. And so we sailed home on a large bang and uh, finished up uh, uh, at, at Brisbane. It was great to be free. It was great to be, uh, to enjoy the pleasures and the little things, the simple things of life are most important. But now look, I, I want to pay a tribute to the nurses. The nurses who suffered so much and were not picked up until a month after the official surrender. The Japanese had sent them into the country in Sabata and told nobody, and they were looking for them. And in that, in that period, they, they formed a choir, and Nora Chambers was in charge of the choir, and uh, they had a great program. And in 1983, the survivors of the choir were invited to go to Washington to sing in the Peninsula Women's Choir, a 60 voice choir, and they sang the whole program of the music that had been created and written up 
and scored by Nora Chambers uh, in uh, uh, the Palamban camp. Margaret Driver was an English missionary and this hymn has become immortal. She died in 1945, not long uh, after. But this was sung every Sunday in 1942 until the numbers began to drop and they had to disband in the choir. Uh, I've got some music here. This is the original tape from the choir and I hope you enjoy it. say something about the wives of we who were prisoners of war. Without them, many of us wouldn't be here today. And we thank them for their love and gracious mercy to us, especially those who love the Lord. Um, we all go through our times of flashbacks, fights and arguments. It's an amazing thing, the memory. And we must learn to forgive, but it is hard to forget. Let me finish with this. Let us therefore, in our 50th year of peace, remember with a lasting gratitude and grateful hearts the sacrifice of those who gave their lives for us and resolve to see that the freedom we enjoy today will be defended in the years to come, whatever the cost may be. Thank you.